Good morning to all of, all of you joining from the East Coast and good evening to those joining us from Japan for our important event today hosted by Asia Society New York on Japan and emerging challenges in cybersecurity and AI. My name is Takako Hikotani, Associate Professor of Political Science at Columbia University. It is an honor to ponderate this important session today with two distinguished speakers, Ms. Mihoko Matsubara and General Sadamasa Owe. The COVID-19 pandemic has served as a reminder of how reliant the world has become to internet usage as both private and public sectors have had to adapt to working remotely for their employer's health and well-being. Consequently, increased reliance on telecommunications had led to increased risk for both the safeguarding of information and infrastructure relied on technology. The shift towards remote work, however, has been challenged by phishing attempts, malware, and hacking attempts worldwide. Nefarious actors have always existed, ranging from being a nuisance to posing serious threats impeding beyond the internet. But now some countries have also adopted some of these capabilities, having realized the value of both information collection and disruption of physical and communication infrastructure made possible through computers and networking technologies. As a result, government and the private sectors have become increasingly sensitive to safeguarding these networks. As the security situation in East Asia continues to evolve, countries, and especially high-tech countries like Japan, must contend with threats from both non-state actors and foreign governments. Both the private sector and governments are having to evolve their capacity to handle new potential threats from emerging technologies, particularly in the role, and, and including the role of artificial intelligence. <laughs> Japan holds a special relevance as a close ally of the United States. And Japan may also offer some lessons from what has been done in the cybersecurity space, artificial intelligence, and future initiatives. To discuss these important yet complicated issues, especially on Japan's approach to emerging challenges in cyberspace and artificial intelligence and how the country is coordinating with its partners, we are very fortunate to welcome two leading experts in this field. Ms. Miho Matsubara, Chief Cybersecurity Strategist for the Nippon Telegraph and Tele Telephone Corporation and General Sadamasa Oe, formerly of the Japan Self-Defense Force, Air Self-Defense Force and now at Harvard University. Please allow me to introduce them briefly. Ms. Mihoko Matsubara has a unique background bridging between government, academia, and industry, having studied and worked in Japan, the United States, and Singapore. She worked for the Ministry of Defense in Japan for nine years before receiving a Fulbright scholarship to study at the Johns Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies. She is the author of a recent book in Japanese titled um, Cybersecurity Strategies, Human Resources and Intelligence for Organizations to Protect Itself from Threats, or Cybersecurity, Intelligence, um, published from Shincho Sha. She has spoken widely on the topic at Brookings, Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, CSIS, Chatham House, and at NATO. General Sadamasa Oe is currently holding a joint appointment as senior fellow at Harvard University Asia Center and as an associate with the program of US-Japan relations at the Weatherhead Center for International Affairs at Harvard University. General Oe is a graduate of the National Defense Academy of Japan and has received master's degrees from the Harvard Kennedy School and the National Defense University. Throughout his distinguished career at the Japan Air Self-Defense Force, he was involved with policy development program promotion and budget requests regarding ballistic missile defense, F-35 introduction, and joint staff reorganization, and more. Most recently, he has served as commander of the Northern Air Defense Command and as commander of Air Material Command. He's also co-author of a recent book on contingencies in Taiwan and Japan security, published in 2020. We will first ask Ms. Matsubara to speak, followed by General Owe. Ms. Mazubara would focus on an extremely important issue and something that is of interest to us today, COVID-19 threats and to healthcare. Then we will ask General Owe to share his expertise on military use of artificial intelligence and where Japan stands on this issue. So without, um, I'm sorry, one more thing to the audience members. Um, we, are, we are very much looking forward to your questions. 
Um, and please submit your questions by commenting on Facebook, on YouTube, or emailing to moderator at asiasociety.org. So now I'd like to turn the microphone to uh, Ms. Matsubara. Please, Ms. Matsubara. Hi, thank you so much. So can I have my slide, please? Thank you. So thank you for having me. So I'd like to focus on something really relevant and really concerning to everybody during this pandemic, COVID-19 and cyber attacks on the healthcare. Next slide, please. So unfortunately, we really started to see an increasing number of cyber attacks on everybody, but especially the healthcare which really we need to have a good access to on a 24 seven basis, especially during this pandemic. And I think there are three main reasons why they are targeting the healthcare sector during this pandemic. First, unfortunately, uh, the healthcare sector has been traditionally really reluctant to invest in cybersecurity compared to other sectors like the financial sector. For example, the healthcare sector tend to spend only three to 4% of their IT budget for cybersecurity, whereas the financial sector uses uh, six to 14% of their IT budget for cybersecurity. So there's a significant gap between healthcare sector and other sectors. Second, because they don't have much budget for cybersecurity, so it also decreases the maturity level of cybersecurity for the healthcare sector. So the most of cyber attacks are coming from phishing me emails or spear phishing emails. I'm sure that not everybody has received a phishing or spear phishing emails before. So it's really extreme to, exclusive, ex, extremely to, important to have a good email scanning and filtering tools. However, 86% of healthcare institutions do not even implement these best practices to have email scanning and filtering tools. So it leaves healthcare institutions really vulnerable to cyber attacks. And third, and finally, um, there are cyber attacks on the healthcare and the cold chain, because cold chain is something really crucial to have a secure and safe transportation of the COVID-19 vaccinations. But immediately after this news came out, bad guys started to target uh, cold chain uh, by cyber espionage and the disruptive nature of ransomware attacks. Next slide, please. So here's uh, some statistics, really interesting statistics are from the NTT uh, Global Threat Intelligence Report last year. And this uh, red circled portion is healthcare sector. And you can see that the maturity level of the healthcare sector is much lower compared to other sectors like high tech, uh, manufacturing, or uh, financial sector. So it really worries us. So next slide, please. So ransomware attacks is a really disruptive nature and then the monetizing uh, the cyber attacks. And if ransomware attacks uh, take down IT systems or IT services at hospitals, for instance, it means that hospital, hospital loses their access to their database on patients. And if they don't have a timely manner access to their patient's data or allergy or medical treatment, then they have to suspend their medical treatment and in the worst case scenario, it can be death. And I wanna share uh, some specific example of that uh, in a couple of minutes. So that's why you can see that the hospitals and healthcare institutions are under more pressures these days to recover their access to IT systems promptly when they are unfortunately attacked by ransomware attacks. Next slide, please. So here's an example. So you may wonder, okay, so ransomware attacks. So don't know, if we get hit by a ransomware attack, so how much money they will uh, demand to, to pay? So here's an example. So the University of California, San Francisco Medical School was unfortunately hit 
by an anthem attack last June. And they made a really difficult choice to pay because if they pay, then the ransomware money will be used for uh, another attack on other institutions. So typically, uh, law enforcement discourages uh, victims to pay ransom to ransomware attackers. However, uh, due to the, the urgent nature of this uh, damage caused by this ransomware attack, this university had to make a really, really difficult decision. And they announced that they had to decided to pay 1.14 million US dollars. So that's huge. Especially when you think about now how stretched the, the, the resources are at any of the medical institutions on this planet. Next slide, please. And Japan is not immune to this type of uh, disruptive nature of ransomware attacks. For example, in October 2020, uh, Shionogi uh, Pharmaceutical Company is, is actually the one of the biggest uh, Japanese pharmaceutical companies and that is uh, working on to produce uh, COVID-19 vaccines as well. So their Taiwanese branch was hit by a ransomware attack. So this shows us that everybody is under this threat. Next slide, please. So actually, this type of ransomware attacks on hospitals have been happening over the last several years. And after each time, uh, cybersecurity professionals raise their concern that what if this kind of disruptive ransomware attack uh, stop uh, and suspend our medical treatments at a hospital? And what if somebody dies? And this worst case scenario might have happened last September. So Dusseldorf University Clinic uh, was hit by a ransomware attack. Um, and they had, because they lost their access to their IT systems, so hospital had to suspend their medical treatments and they had to rapidly uh, transfer all the, the patients to other hospitals nearby. And one of the patients had to be transported was a 78 year old lady. And she was at a very critical condition. And unfortunately, after she was sent to another hospital nearby, she died. And the local law enforcement first announced that maybe this was her death was caused by a negligence manslaughter. And at that time, all of the media in Japan, the United States, and Europe, uh, you name it, and they jumped on this uh, news and they said, maybe this is the first known death from a cyber attack or a first known direct death from a ransomware attack. But two months later, uh, law enforcement in Germany concluded that her death was not caused by the cyber attack, only because she was already in a very, very critical condition. And even if she was able to get a surgery in a timely manner, she, no, the law enforcement believed that no, that kind of medical treatment would not be able to save her. However, even after this sort of case, um, uh, we start. We continue to see an uh, increasing number of ransomware attacks on other hospitals all around the world. So I'm sure that this kind of uh, sad news and dreadful news will happen again, unless we change our mindset to enhance cybersecurity for our medical institutions. Next slide, please. So in addition to disruptive nature of cyber attacks, we also face a cyber espionage to steal information on COVID-19 uh, medicines and vaccinations. Because vaccines especially is a key to recover our economy during this pandemic. And it is a key to, to, to have a more influence in the world. And if you can get this uh, crucial information on COVID-19 vaccines, then you can give 
uh, to your own national industry, the market competitiveness. So that is why uh, bad guys, uh, both our state-sponsored actors and criminals, especially state-sponsored actors, started to, to go after the vaccine-related information. Next slide, please. So again, um, Japan is not immune to this type of cyber espionage. And uh, the CrowdStrike, one of the leading uh, US-based uh, cybersecurity company, found out that cyber espionage has been uh, launched against multiple healthcare institutions to develop COVID-19 vaccines in Japan between April and October 2020. Unfortunately, cyber defense really worked and no breaches have been reported, but we really still to, to raise our, our awareness and guard to, to fight against this kind of uh, malicious cyber espionage. Next slide, please. So you might have seen a recent news article about the North Korean cyber espionage uh, and they, are, they seem to be after everybody uh, who, who is you know, working on the, the COVID-19 vaccinations in the United States, in the UK, Germany, South Korea, you name it. And what I, what I found really um, intriguing is that you know, they used uh, um, very traditional phishing emails like malicious website uh, link, but also they used uh, LinkedIn and WhatsApp to send a fake uh, job posting to, to lure people who are interested in uh, changing their job. So that's really relevant to everybody because during this um, economic turndown, uh, people were worried about their job security and they naturally get more interested in a new job uh, outlook. Next slide, please. So, we started to learn about the cold chain is really crucial for this COVID-19 vaccine uh, last fall. And immediately after that, uh, bad guys are really smart on this. And they started to target uh, cold chain companies by ransomware attacks and espionage. And for, for example, in November 2020, Americold uh, is the, the, the biggest cold chain company in the United States and second the largest cold storage facility operator in the world was hit by a ransomware attack and uh, their uh, business operations had to be suspended for a while. Next slide, please. So, we unfortunately uh, continue to see uh, both types of cyber attacks on the healthcare supply chains, uh, both um, cyber espionage and ransomware attacks. But I still see some silver lining in this dark tunnel because there are um, many thousands of cybersecurity professionals immediately stood up uh, after this news came out on cyber attacks against healthcare institutions last spring and they started to launch um, a framework on alliances to share cybersecurity best practices and information and even a free help for impacted healthcare institutions. So if we are not interested in this kind of news and if we are not interested in uh, paying more attention and uh, investing in cybersecurity, then how come healthcare institutions are uh, there in uh, really um, uh, stretched condition can afford to invest in cybersecurity during this pandemic. So it is crucial for us to, to keep raising awareness and uh, helping each other and share uh, best practices uh, to help each other. Because healthcare institutions and healthcare services and vaccines are something really relevant to everybody during this pandemic. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, my company, uh, NTT, has a uh, business operational companies uh, around the world. And one of them, uh, NTT Limited, uh, provided a free uh, cybersecurity consulting services in some countries for impacted uh, medical institutions between uh, last spring and uh, summer. So this is some examples uh, during that time. 
And next slide, please. So thank you very much. So, um, so cybersecurity is really relevant and crucial for everybody and to enhance our cybersecurity capabilities, uh, artificial intelligence is one of the keys because it can facilitate our decision making and also cyber defenses. So I really looking forward to, to learning from uh, General Oe about your presentation on AI. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Mazbara. So now, uh, please, would you please start General Owe? Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much for the nice transition, uh, uh, Ms. Masbara, and thank you, uh, Dr. Hikotani. I'm grateful for the uh, Asia uh, Society, New York, uh, to set up this uh, very exciting uh, occasion and inviting me to this uh, presentation. I am going to talk about artificial intelligence, military use, and Japan. Um, I'm not going to talk about the uh, Terminator because that's a, a futuristic uh, application of the uh, artificial intelligence, and that's a very neat, far future. I'm going to talk about, about the uh, uh, narrow AI. So next slide, please. Advances in artificial intelligence have the potential to change the character of warfare for generations to come. Whichever nation harness AI first will have a decisive advantage on the battlefield for many, many years. We have to get there first. This is a remark by uh, then Secretary of Defense, Espar, in 2019. And uh, this view is shared by uh, Russian President Putin and Chinese Communist Party uh, Xi Jinping. Um, United States declared the great power competition in 2017 national security strategy. So uh, in this uh, great power competition, artificial intelligence is a centerpiece of the uh, uh, race. However, uh, artificial intelligence is not mature enough to apply the uh, military application particularly uh, lethal weapon. And uh, this is the uh, very important topic for everybody uh, because the uh, premature artificial intelligence application and military uh, application is uh, end up to the uh, unintended uh, consequences as well as the uh, fatal uh, accidents. Next slide, please. So who is going to win this uh, artificial intelligence race? Uh, Dr. Kai Fu Li uh, says, China will dominate the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, in his uh, book, AI Superpowers, uh, Dr. Kai Fu Li uh, elaborate the uh, Chinese advantage over the United States, including big uh, commercial uh, market, uh, which can provide the uh, big data critical to develop the artificial intelligence and Chinese uh, industry uh, military collaboration. Uh, they call the uh, civil military fusion. Uh, Dr. Kai Fuli was born in Taiwan and he's a venture capitalist, former CEO of Google China and ranked by Forbes as number one among the leaders of China's AI revolution. He graduated uh, Columbia University and received the doctorate uh, degrees from Carnegie Mellon University. So his uh, 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 career uh, shows the advantage of the China. Born in Taiwan, educated in United States, and now he is leading the AI innovation in China. But Dr. Kai Fu Li uh, doesn't talk very much about the uh, military application of the AI in China. Next slide, please. Uh, Elsa Kanya, she is a PhD uh, candidate in Harvard University. She published a report, Battlefield Singularity. I believe this is the first and the most comprehensive analysis of Chinese uh, military application of the artificial intelligence. She says uh, China 
first uh, studied uh, American approach of the uh, military AI use. But now China is taking a very different approach than the United States. Uh, PLA, People's Liberation Army, is now trying to surpass the United States military forces in a field of the military application of the AI. Now China is focusing on the application of AI in uh, these uh, field, intelligent and autonomous systems, AI enabled data fusion, information processing and intelligent analysis, defense offense and command in information warfare, simulation war gaming and actual combat training, and most importantly, intelligentized support to command decision making. So China seems to pursue the intelligentized warfare uh, fully utilizing the artificial intelligence in the battlefield. Next slide, please. These are just an example of the application of uh, AI in military weapons. Uh, UAV and drone is probably the most mature application of AI in the military field. This picture uh, is a drone called HALO, manufactured by the uh, Israeli defense companies and China imported this uh, uh, UAV. Uh, this HALOP, once launched, uh, is going to loiter in the air for several hours and try to uh, uh, find out uh, respective target. And sensor on board uh, identifies some uh, potential target. Then artificial intelligence uh, recognizes that target and match uh, whether it is a legitimate target or not. Once uh, the drone identify the target, then it will automatically attack against the target. So this process is going to be done fully automatically. It, the only human being decision is whether he is going to launch this weapon or not. So, uh, Another application of the uh, uh, artificial intelligence is uh, uh, pattern recognitions, uh, such as facial uh, recognitions, as well as the uh, information warfare. Uh, cyberspace is a very good place for the artificial intelligence. Next slide, please. And this is the, uh, probably uh, the most important area for the military application of AI. Today's battlefield involves space, air, land, sea, and also uh, cyberspace. All these are, uh, domains are uh, 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 integrated in, as a battlefield. So we call this uh, multi-domain operation or cross-domain operation. And connecting these uh, different domain, uh, we have to have some uh, uh, network. First, we have to uh, observe uh, to understand the situation, what's going on on the battlefield, and then orient what we are supposed to do against enemy's moves and decide the course of action and then act. This loop is called UDA loop, Operation Observe, Orient, Decide, Act loop. To win the battle uh, uh, in this multi-domain operation, you have to go through this UDA loop faster than the enemy. Uh, to do so, uh, data plays a very important role. We need to gather all the data from space uh, uh, satellite, uh, radars on the ground, as well as the internet and all available data are going to be gathered and stored in the cloud. And the artificial intelligence algorithms uh, manage those data, uh, analyze the data, and then uh, uh, provide the uh, uh, directed uh, outcome uh, based upon uh, what the uh, commander uh, needs to uh, extract from this data. And the commander will uh, be uh, supported by the artificial intelligence uh, regarding the uh, options, uh, which course of action he is going to take. And the artificial intelligence provide the assessment of this, uh, of each uh, course of action. And then uh, commander decide uh, the option and then employ that uh, course of action. So 
Uh, all of these are uh, processes supported by uh, big data uh, algorithm and then uh, uh, artificial uh, intelligence. Now the United States uh, uh, military forces are trying to uh, develop and construct joint enterprises uh, of uh, defense infrastructure, uh, which is a big cloud uh, of uh, Department of Defense wide. Uh, all the data are going to be stored in this cloud and provided to uh, uh, commanders as well as the, uh, uh, each uh, operators in, 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 the, in the battlefield. So in that sense, uh, artificial intelligence and data uh, uh, is an essential part of this today's uh, large domain, cross domain operation. Please, next slide. So uh, United States and China uh, is uh, competing uh, in this uh, military application of the artificial intelligence. But each state has its own uh, circumstances uh, to uh, proceed uh, this uh, development of military AI. And I think the, there are three factors uh, to drive this uh, military uh, AI application. One is resources. Uh, artificial intelligence requires the computing capacity, uh, so the uh, computer hardware, uh, high quality uh, uh, semiconductors are very important assets and also the uh, talents. We need the uh, experts to develop the algorithm. And also I should put one critical word in this slide, which is data. Uh, we need uh, very high quality uh, big data uh, to develop uh, uh, mature and the trustworthy uh, uh, artificial intelligence. To do so, of course, we need money. And the second one is the, uh, 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 let's see. Second one is the policy and strategy, of course. And uh, uh, each uh, country has its own uh, uh, policy and strategy. Uh, China adapted the uh, civil military fusions to mobilize all uh, assets uh, at their hand, uh, including the uh, industry. As uh, Dr. Kai Fuli said, China has a big data uh, potential and also the uh, PLA uh, collaborate with those industries and academia to uh, uh, develop their own uh, algorithms. United States uh, put a National Security Committee on Artificial Intelligence uh, which is a Congress mandated uh, entity to develop a national strategy on the military application of AI. And uh, uh, Japan is also uh, uh, adopted the uh, uh, national uh, strategy of the artificial intelligence, but uh, those uh, Japan's uh, strategy is uh, mainly for the purpose of the business and commercial sector. Uh, completely missing of the uh, uh, military uh, aspects. Uh, OECD.ai provides a really good source of uh, this uh, uh, military application of AI, uh, as well as other application of the artificial intelligence. Next slide, please. How these uh, driving factors come across uh, in each race? Uh, this is just a, an example. Uh, TSMC, Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company. Uh, TSMC is the biggest uh, top foundry to manufacture high quality semiconductor. And TSMC provides uh, microchips to uh, links in the United States, which produces F35 uh, parts. And uh, TSMC, also provides uh, uh, semiconductors to high silicon, uh, which is uh, producing these some parts uh, to uh, Huawei. So TS, TS, TSMC is uh, uh, you know uh, focal point uh, of uh, tug of war between the uh, China and the United States. Uh, U.S. government asked TSMC to. Uh, uh, construct the uh, factory in the United States and TS TSMC agreed uh, to move on to the uh, uh, Arizona. 
And the uh, US government also prohibit TMCs to export uh, high quality uh, chips uh, to high silicon by putting the uh, high silicon uh, technology company in the entity list. And the uh, US government is going to try to tighten this uh, control of the uh, uh, military sensitive uh, technology of the artificial intelligence. Next slide, please. These are four, 14 emerging technologies uh, which will be uh, controlled uh, by uh, uh, all the governments. Uh, highlighted in red is uh, uh, AI, machine learning technologies, and uh, relevant technologies. So Japanese government, uh, as well as the Japanese company, uh, should be uh, aware of these uh, uh, technologies. Uh, they are very sensitive for the application of uh, military use. Next slide, please. Again, uh, what is the Japanese uh, uh, status? As I said, Japan has uh, very good uh, uh, resources, although talents are uh, still uh, insufficient to proceed. Uh, policy strategy, as I said, uh, Japan has already developed the uh, national uh, strategy for the artificial intelligence, but that strategy is lack of uh, military perspective. And constraints, uh, ethics and safety, uh, these are very important uh, 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 characters. Uh, future military application of AI should uh, uh, respect uh, because the uh, military AI uh, involves the uh, fatality, uh, lethality, uh, premature application of military AI may result in the uh, disaster and uh, fatal accidents. So uh, development of uh, uh, military AI uh, should uh, take into consideration of these factors from the beginnings. As I said, Japan uh, has uh, very uh, little concern about these things because the lack of the uh, military application and strategy and policy. Next slide, please. So I'd like to propose the uh, implications to Japan. Uh, Japan should develop strategy for military use of AI and Japan should collaborate with the US on military AI and research and development because the, uh, uh, as, a, as an allied partner, uh, Japanese Air Defense Force needs to uh, uh, work together in a future battlefield with the counterparts of the US military forces. So uh, AI application should be a uh, good uh, collaboration work uh, for both Japan and the United States. Japan also needs to enhance AI talents and public awareness, as well as strengthen AI technologies and their controls. So with that, I'd like to take a question. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, General Owe. Um, so once again, I'd like to remind the audience that we were looking, at, looking forward to your questions. So please send it either through your comments or through um, email. Um, so once again, um, I'd like to thank the two speakers for their wonderful presentations and start by um, taking advantage of this moment for me to ask questions. Um, Ms. Masbar, I, I, as a non-expert on this topic, I was really surprised to know that there's actually multiple facets to this issue, especially just even looking at the case of COVID, that cybersecurity has to do with the disruption, um, espionage, and disinformation. And I think you made it very clear that um, all aspects are very related to human lives, which makes the issue very pertinent. But I think in general, COVID-19, if you, you, you call the silver lining, I think there's a lot of so, uh, things that we can call the silver lining of COVID that is related to issue of um, highlighting what the vulnerabilities we have in the system. And I think this is across all areas. So is there one area that you think is especially uh, vulnerable in the case of Japan, or what is the weakest link uh, among those things you mentioned as case studies for things that have happened in other countries? What are you most concerned about in terms of where in the broader system of cybersecurity issues that's related to COVID. Thank you. Thank you. 
So I, I really know that this sounds cliche, but the weakest link is always humans. Because if people are not interested in uh, cybersecurity and don't care what's happening around the world in the physical domain or cyber domain, then how can you expect that they will enhance cybersecurity or physical security? So that's, I think that that's a fundamental problem mm -hmm. in the healthcare sector in terms of cybersecurity because it is so that the statistics that uh, traditionally the healthcare sector has been really reluctant to invest in cybersecurity and the cybersecurity maturity level mm -hmm. is much lower compared to other sectors. Mm -hmm. So I, I think the, it, it's up to the executives and leaders in the healthcare institutions and also uh, in the healthcare supply chain uh, organizations to, to really have a big picture of business risks and how to allocate their business uh, resources uh, to prioritize how to enhance security in um, cybersecurity or the physical domain or COVID-19 vaccinations, you name it, because there are so many problems in these days. And, and uh, if you don't have the big picture of the, the entire uh, business risk, then you, you cannot have a good um, process uh, to protect uh, everything. Thank you. Um, at this point, there's a related question from the audience, from Adam. Thanks for your um, question. So his question is, um, um, how concerned should we be on threats coming from private, sec private players versus governments? Which do you think is a more graver threat? Hackers and hacker groups and competing companies, he asks. Sure. So, uh, so there are two major types of cyber attacks these days on uh, uh, healthcare institutions. One is uh, cyber espionage, and the other one is ransomware attacks. And ransomware attacks usually are coming from uh, cyber criminals. Um, but uh, North Korea is one exception, uh, reportedly, because North Korea does launch uh, some ransomware attacks. And uh, cyber espionage to steal uh, COVID-19 uh, related uh, intellectual property, uh, especially uh, vaccine information, uh, seems to be uh, mostly from uh, state-sponsored actors and their usual suspects, uh, according to uh, various reports, uh, North Korea, um, Iran, uh, China, and Russia. But of course, not all of those countries uh, have denied strongly about the accusations. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so I have a question now to General Owe. Um, I believe that there is an awareness, at least in Japan, that this area of artificial intelligence is very important for Japan's security. But as you look at the defense white papers, it tends to be um, in the line of argument related to um, declining population and possibly lack of resources, having to look at the efficiency gains from AI and such. But you gave us both optimism and pessimism in the sense that um, there's an increased awareness and we have the resources, we're catching up on talents, but there's a lack of policy and strategy. And as for the talent, I think it's interesting that it made a major news last year that there were multiple um, job opportunities within the Ministry of Defense which on a good side means that there's a lot of uh, awareness that's important, but which actually shows that there needs to be more people working in the defense establishment on this issue. Um, and I guess in that sense, it was a loss for Ministry of Defense that Ms. Matsubara left the Ministry of Defense, but that's um, I, one thing in common for three of us is that we all previously were for the Ministry of Defense. But anyway, coming back to the topic for Japan, so um, if I were to sort of ask the same question that I asked to Ms. Matsubara, what do you think is the most problematic, weakest part, aside from the awareness issue about Japan's AI? Is it that there's lack of political actually looking into the issue? Um, and also what are on the positive side, what are actually where Japan actually might lead or what might be a strength that Japan might have internally in dealing with this um, uh, new technology and the potential of that on defense? Thank you. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> 
That's a very good and important uh, uh, question. Um, I agree the uh, Japanese are facing a uh, declining population. So recruitment uh, is a really, really important and a difficult issue for the uh, Self-Defense Force and the uh, Department of uh, Defense. Artificial intelligence is uh, uh, one solution to uh, you know, uh, substitute the uh, human being by machine. Um, in, in the civilian sector, uh, many applications of the artificial intelligence uh, uh, contribute to this uh, substitu substitution already. So I think the uh, uh, Self-Defense Force uh, should introduce uh, already uh, proved uh, artificial intelligence application in commercial sector to substitute the uh, precious uh, human uh, you know, workforce, such as uh, logistics and uh, management and uh, accounting uh, or uh, uh, just uh, uh, desk work. Those are easy, uh, easily uh, be uh, substituted. So that uh, self-defense force will be able to allocate those uh, manpower to more uh, important uh, job. Uh, so I think the uh, AI should be used in that way. Um, problems is as uh, uh, Matsubara san mentioned, uh, human uh, being uh, talents uh, is the uh, most uh, prob problematic uh, or, or uh, 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 probably the uh, all, all Japan should uh, tackle on uh, because as I said, um, those are experts, engineer, uh, insufficient uh, all over the world. So the uh, United States, uh, uh, China, uh, everybody wants to, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, attract those uh, talents uh, to uh, their uh, initiatives. Uh, Japan uh, is a uh, country of uh, technology, and each company has its own uh, uh, unique uh, technology, which can uh, utilize for the uh, development of artificial intelligence. So we should nurture those uh, unique uh, technologies uh, possessed by the uh, civilian sector, uh, I think this is a very positive uh, uh, aspect of, of Japan. But again, uh, Japanese uh, government uh, should uh, pay more attention and uh, develop a uh, comprehensive strategy and policy uh, to prioritize uh, the allocation of the resources, uh, budgets to uh, civilian sector, and the military sectors as well uh, for the development of the artificial intelligence. And again, uh, uh, lack of the uh, clear picture how to apply artificial intelligence for military use, uh, this is not only the uh, you know, problem, but also dangerous because uh, someday uh, self-defense force uh, people uh, needs to fight uh, in the battlefield, uh, which is totally uh, operated by artificial intelligence, such as drone. And it is, I, I, I think, uh, ridiculous to fight, uh, you know, human beings fighting against the uh, uh, UAV. So uh, uh, self-defense force uh, should uh, be brave enough to introduce the uh, unmanned vehicle uh, more and more uh, to substitute the uh, pilots, uh, human being. Thank you, General Owe. Um, there, I'm very happy there's questions coming in. So first I'd like to start by coming back to you again, General Owe. This is a question from Lauren. Um, she is happy to hear that we're time away from, times away from reaching the Terminator movie phase, but how far are we from applying AI technology considering the face recognition? I think you started that discussion right now but uh, what are the ethical problems and how far are we, do you think? How, how urgent of something? Is it something that we have to think about as citizens? Thank you. Yeah, the title of the uh, uh, doc, uh, uh, Ms. Elsa Kania's uh, report is uh, Battlefield Singularity. Singularity means the, uh, those times the uh, uh, Terminator is uh, materialized. And uh, uh, experts of the artificial intelligence people uh, predict uh, probably 2000, uh, uh, 2050 at the earliest timing for those uh, uh, general 
artificial intelligence will be uh, realized. Uh, maybe uh, if it is uh, materialized, uh, I don't know. But again, uh, safety and ethics uh, concern is really important. Uh, <clears throat> United States uh, 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 National Security Commission on Artificial Intelligence uh, put emphasis on this ethical aspect uh, to convince uh, public uh, to proceed uh, military application of the AI. And uh, uh, civilian companies like uh, Google, uh, Amazon's uh, heavily involved with the uh, development of the uh, cloud services for the military use. And some employee, employees uh, protest the company uh, not to participate in this military uh, initiatives uh, because of the ethical concern. So uh, 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 research and development phase uh, should pay attention uh, to this uh, ethics and safety uh, aspects uh, as well, as I said. Um, still, uh, we are not sure uh, how mature is mature enough uh, because today's artificial intelligence cannot explain uh, why they uh, made that uh, decision. Uh, now the company is trying to uh, develop uh, explainable artificial intelligence, but the technology is not mature enough. And uh, sometimes artificial intelligence makes uh, silly uh, mistakes. Uh, human being uh, doesn't make such a silly, uh, foolish mistake at all. Uh, but uh, uh, because the uh, uh, bad data uh, input uh, produces a bad uh, uh, outcome and uh, artificial intelligence just automatically makes such a foolish decision. Uh, uh, so, uh, to answer that question, how mature is mature enough? Uh, we convince that's the, uh, the, the uh, you know uh, uh, things uh, we have to uh, decide, or, or uh, we have to have some consensus to apply the artificial intelligence in uh, uh, critical use. Thank you. Um, coming back, I think this question goes to both of you, but especially to uh, Ms. Matsubara. This is a question from Andrew about what the role, is there a role, or what is the role of the military or the self-defense force in Japan um, can play to support corporate cybersecurity? Is there a role for the military part to play? Thank you. So cybersecurity touches upon almost everything uh, in the 21st century. So maybe before this uh, Asia Society's webinar, uh, some people might have not thought about that now cybersecurity is related to AI, cybersecurity related to healthcare or coaching, but actually it's relevant to, to everything. So that is, so, but however, cyber, what makes cybersecurity is really complicated and really problematic is that because cybersecurity covers almost everything. So to be an expert on cybersecurity, you have to know everything, but that's, that's impossible. So, so that is why it is crucial to have a, the team of, to, to um, cover um, subject matter experts and in the different areas. So that is why uh, public-private partnerships are so important. So that's why you have to have a good uh, public-private partnerships uh, between uh, Ministry of Defense or uh, Department of Defense and the private sectors in the different sectors because you, you have you have a, pre, a role to play, and actually the, the different uh, sectors of critical infrastructure have interdependency because uh, electricity uh, is really uh, closely related to. Uh, 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 water surprise and energy surprise, and uh, energy cannot be uh, transported uh, without uh, good transportation. So everything is connected. So that is why the Ministry of Defense or Department of Defense have to collaborate with uh, different sectors of critical infrastructure. Thank you. Um, do you have something to add, General Owe, please? Uh, yes. Um, in Japan, basically, 
uh, cyber security is responsible for everyone, each of uh, uh, entity. Self-defense force is responsible to secure the uh, their network, and uh, uh, civilian sectors are responsible for their uh, cyber security for their own. So the uh, government uh, NISC uh, provides some uh, guidance and uh, suggestions uh, for those are uh, companies and uh, uh, government uh, agencies and uh, self-defense force. But again, uh, each uh, organization is, is responsible for their own cybersecurity. I think this is very problematic. As uh, uh, Mats Barasan mentions, cybersecurity is connected, every, everything. And uh, intelligence, uh, community plays significant role, and civilian sectors are uh, almost impossible uh, to uh, gather all the intelligence necessary for their cyber security. So I think the government uh, must be responsible uh, for all the uh, cyber security, in particular, critical infrastructure such as electricity, water supplies, and stuff like that. And uh, uh, those uh, companies uh, operating those uh, critical infrastructure should be supported by the government. Uh, I just want to add that things. And uh, in the United States, uh, United States are uh, you know uh, exposed to the uh, severe cyber attack from uh, all over the world. So uh, uh, Homeland Defense uh, Agency has uh, uh, CISA. Cyber Security and Infrastructure Security Agency, which is responsible for the uh, National uh, Critical Infrastructure uh, Cyber Defense. And also uh, uh, US forces have uh, Cyber Command, uh, and now Cyber Command is responsible uh, to protect uh, critical infrastructure uh, against the cyber attack. And also the uh, uh, intelligence communities uh, uh, collaborating with this uh, uh, cyber command and CISA. Uh, so I think the uh, uh, United States way uh, of a comp comprehensive approach for the cyber security uh, is really, really important. Thank you. Um, so we're almost at the end of the session, but I'd like to ask one last question. Um, which it has to do with areas for collaboration between possible collaboration between the United States and Japan. So, uh, Ms. Matsubara, can you highlight some, some, especially areas to focus on as potential areas of cooperation where we can bring together some comparative advantages we have? And also the same to you, General Owe, about areas for co collaboration between the United States and, the, and Japan. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, again, I'd like to go back to the healthcare sector issue because um, uh, vaccinations is really important and all of the countries around the world want to have uh, a vaccination supplies uh, these days. And now some countries have their domestic uh, vaccinations, but some countries have to uh, import uh, from other countries. So that is why the healthcare sector cybersecurity is relevant to, to everybody, not only in a specific sector like cold chain or uh, healthcare institutions or pharmacy, pharmaceutical companies, but every single country on this planet. But no one single organization or no one single sector or no single country can have uh, the whole picture of cyber threats because it can be from anywhere uh, in the world. So that is why you have to have a good cooperation. And because the Japan and the United States are such a close uh, allies, and because you know, we surprise and the vaccinations and the medical uh, surprise uh, each other. So that is why um, I really want to ask everybody who is listening to this webinar that in a very, uh, in your interest in this issue is crucial to have a good cooperation on cybersecurity between Japan and the United States. Thank you. Thank you. Um, General Owe? Yes, uh, collaboration is very important. Um, the Japan and the United States are allies. So I think the uh, uh, Self-Defense Force and the uh, US military forces uh, should find one good uh, uh, collaboration work uh, for research and development of artificial intelligence. 
Uh, I think the um, uh, United States uh, uh, emphasized the importance of the uh, uh, cooperation with allies. And the uh, Joint Artificial Intelligence Center uh, established inside of the uh, Department of Defense, uh, JAG uh, Joint AI Center uh, is seeking uh, how to proceed the uh, cooperation and collaboration with allies and partners. And Japan is actively involved with this uh, collaboration. So uh, one uh, area, uh, this is my uh, personal opinion, but uh, one area for collaboration is to study Chinese uh, uh, strategy and policy and then uh, uh, level of maturity of the military application of AI. Uh, joint study, a joint study of, of this topic uh, with uh, US and uh, uh, self-defense force is a very good uh, uh, topic uh, for collaboration. And I think there are many, many options for uh, collaboration, not only in the artificial intelligence sector, but also as Mats Barasan mentioned, cybersecurity is a, is a uh, common uh, uh, topics for both Japan and the United States. Thank you very much. Um, I think we learn as, um, as citizens importance of the issue, not just because we might become targets or become, become victims, especially in the case highlighted by Ms. Matsubara, but it's actually a very important issue that um, encompasses all segments of society and that, and, and that there's some ethical issues involved as well as um, highlighted by General Owe. So it's very important for us to be informed citizens on this topic of cybersecurity and AI. And I think the two speakers today, what explained to us very, um, in a very um, easy to understand way how the two sectors interact, as well as the importance of the issue for both the United States and Japan, and for finally the areas of collaborations between the two democratic countries. So thank you um, to the speakers for their presentations and to the audience uh, for their very interesting and important questions and to Asia Society uh, for um, sponsoring this very important event today. So thank you very much. Um, have a nice day for everybody in East, East Coast and good night to everybody in Japan. Thank you so much. <laughs>